It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, it's now clear that the Premier has decided to ignore his medical officer of health and his advice to address the health care crisis faced by our children. That decision is clear to anyone who has seen him every day since the public health officials in this province urged adults to wear masks indoors to protect children. Without saying a thing, the Premier has told parents they're on their own, and they can only hope that the overstretched doctors, nurses, and healthcare workers can protect their children as we go through this respiratory crisis, this hospital crisis. When did the Premier decide that the children of Ontario were expendable? And to respond, Department Assistant Minister of Health, member for Eglinton Lawrence. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. As we've said many times, the difficult and complex uh, fall that was predicted has materialized, and we have three uh, viral threats. And it's changing with every wave. Initially, we had personal protective equipment, we had adult ICUs, we had adult war beds that needed attention, and now it is uh, pediatric ICUs. And frankly, it is because, not of COVID, but because of RSV and influenza. And that is why we plan for that. We've said this many times. We made investments in the NICU units, we made investments in pediatric hospitals, and we expanded our health human resources across the board and beds across the board in hospital. But as Dr. Uh, uh, Simpson noted, it's not unusual for 14- and 16-year-old patients to be looked after in adult ICU beds. That is commonly done, and that is what is happening now. We're making Response. sure that we have the resources for our children and that they get the best care possible, and we know our health care workers will deliver it. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, again to the Premier. Well. The Minister of Health yesterday told us the province had planned for this surge of illness and put policies in place to protect our children. We just heard that repeated. But if this was a plan, it was a terrible one. Yes. Pediatric emergency rooms are bursting at the seams. Hospital CEOs are desperately calling for help, and they've had to implement emergency measures, including moving children who need intensive care into adult hospitals. The Minister's, quote, plan has created chaos and put children at risk. Will the Premier finally speak up and tell us how we can possibly defend this mismanagement? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I understand the member opposite may have prepared his question before he heard my answer, but I actually addressed that very concern. Dr. Simpson, the public health officer for Ontario Health, said it's not unusual for 14 and 16 year old patients to be looked after in adult ICUs. That is commonly done, unquote. And that is what is happening now. But as Dr. Simpson also noted, what is important to emphasize is that all pediatric patients will be seen when they come to hospital. If they require admission, then we will look after them. Like Dr. Simpson said, I have great faith in com and confidence in our health care providers across the province. They are expertly trained to support all of our health care needs and will do whatever it takes to make sure our children get the care that they need. Supplementary. Final Thank supplementary. You, to the Premier, we all know the Premier will use the long wait times, the overcrowding, the emergency room closures to justify bringing in U.S.-style health care to Ontario. He'll say we need to innovate, just like Mike Harris did when he privatized our home care system. The private home care providers were going to do things better, faster, cheaper. Remember that, Speaker? Well, today we all know that none of that happened. Why is this government so determined to dismantle our publicly funded, publicly delivered health care system? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and uh, I just have to say, I thought the opposition was trying to ask questions about what was going on in hospitals today, not some fantasy that they think might be happening in the future. But let's just talk about what's happening in our health care system and what's happened in the past. In the 2012 Auditor General's report on health human resources, it was revealed that Northern Ontario had a shortage of 200 physicians or 40,000 hours of care, and yet little was done. But who held the balance of 
power at that time. I think that was these guys, the opposition, the NDP. Order. The former Order. Premier admitted uh, that she was freezing hospital spending for years and in 2015 eliminated 50 medical residency positions from Ontario. And they defended that decision when 800,000 Ontarians were without a family doctor by saying, quote, we are scaling back to make better use of our health care dollars. Yes. This reduction came at a time uh, the same year with 250 nurses being laid off. You supported them every step of the way. We're fixing the system. Thank you. To make their comments through the chair. I remind members to make their comments through the chair. The next question, the member for Sudbury. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, questions for the Minister of Education. I'd also get the page to pass over these uh, uh, QP education support worker uh, forms to him as well. Uh, students deserve an EC in every classroom, Speaker, and parents need an EA for every student that needs personal care to attend school. The people across Ontario depend on custodians and cleaners to protect the health and children health of our children. Instead of money for ECEs in every classroom or additional funds for EAs, the government passes the burden to parents to go out and hunt down scarce private resources. Why doesn't the Conservative government think that it's worth properly investing in the people and the public school supports that parents already have available in our schools to help their children catch up and be successful? Talk for a moment. Um, I'm just going to remind the House that we're, we're not going to um, ask the pages to deliver notes uh, during question period anymore. Start the clock. Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, uh, what I can confirm to the member opposite is that under our progressive conservative government, we have hired nearly 7,000 additional education workers supporting our kids within our schools. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, not only have we hired more, we pledge to continue funding 1,800 additional education workers and 800 teachers that will support our kids within our schools, part of our program before the union. Mr. Speaker, we fulfilled our end of the bargain. We said we would repeal Bill 28, and that was the biggest barrier to getting a deal. And then 48 hours after doing so in good faith, they announced a strike notice. We said we would increase pay, $335 million more million this week compared to last week, a material improvement for every worker, especially for the lowest paid, and they've still rejected the offer. We now have moved to a flat rate, a demand of the union not to differentiate wages for lower and higher income. We did that too, and we still don't have a deal. And I think, Speaker, it is abundantly clear what the fault line is uh, preventing the union from accepting a deal. It is a desire for higher wages, and our kids should be in school on Monday. I agree. Thank you, Speaker. I don't mind delivering these over to the, to the minister and myself. It's important he hears from the actual workers instead of ignoring them. Yes. Sean and Julia are the two parent, are parents of two children with autism in my riding. They reached out to my office to express how much their education support workers mean to them and to their children. These workers keep June and Chaz safe. They help them to learn and be successful and happy at school each and every day. More support workers are needed to help support kids like ours to integrate into mainstream classes. When schools don't have the staff, parents like us have to pay ABA staff out of pocket or kids can't go to mainstream class to work in integration. When your family relies on education support workers for the well-being and safety of your child and this government creates conditions that drives them away from the profession, that's really scary. These workers are truly essential. This is not about money. This is about knowing that the workers that children get to know, workers that parents trust and depend on, would not only be here for the kids today, but continue to be here for the kids in the future. My question, Speaker, is question. when will the Premier admit that wanting kids with exceptional needs to have support for the entire school day, not just a fraction of the day, is not about money, it's about kids? Yeah. 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 Mr. Speaker, if we're going to uh, highlight stories of the impact on children with special education needs. And I'd hope the member opposite would accept that that child who depends on routine should be in school on Monday. And they should not be out of school again. Again, just two weeks later, this is the, the, what's becoming a casual invocation of a strike notice on a, uh, every few weeks in this province, every few years. That's not acceptable. And the NDP wants Order. to normalize strikes because they were standing with the union Order. when kids were out of school. They should be standing up for parents. Stand with this government. Let's get a deal. Let's keep kids in class. Order. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, frankly, enough is enough. The minister makes more than $160,000 a year. He's calling workers like the fever of children. I'm going to ask the government side not to do that again. <laughs> Start the clock. 
Member for Sudbury has the floor. The minister makes more than $160,000 a year, and he's calling workers who have to feed their children at food banks greedy. The minister says his offer is generous, but it doesn't even keep up with inflation, let alone let them get ahead. The minister calls $1,600 a year a generous offer, but it's one-tenth of what every backbench MPP got when they're promoted to parliamentary assistant. The minister says there's been 2,246 2, lost days since 1988, and in terms of school years, that's 11 and a half Stop the clock. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. The member will take his seat. The government House Leader will come to order. Minister of Economic Development Trade will come to order. The member for Kitchener Conestoga will come to order. The member for St. Catharines will come to order. The government house leader will come to order. Start the clock. The member for Sudbury still has some time. Thank you, Speaker. It made them touch you when I talked about how much money they made. The minister has been saying there has been 2,246 lost days Permit since side, come to order. And in terms of school years, that would be 11 and a half years. Nobody is buying the spin. People are tired of the minister's games. Parents saw through what the Conservatives did last time. My question, Speaker, is when will the Conservative government take the time and energy they waste on spin and just sit down and negotiate a fair deal that will put education support workers in every class and keep them there? And to reply, the Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, it isn't about the money, but the hashtag was 39K is not okay. This entire, this entire campaign Order. has been under the guise of insisting Order. upon higher pay on the backs Opposition of kids. We have significantly increased the pay, $335 million more million in a week. We provided a flat rate. We are maintaining the best benefits and pensions and sick leave. And even still, the never-ending moving yardstick and goalposts of QP accept the deal before us. Accept yes and make sure that kids in this province stay in school every single day, Speaker. The House will come to order. The next question, the member for Niagara Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Through you to the Premier. Yesterday, in a move no one asked for or recommended, this government, with absolutely no consultation, tabled a bill that would allow them to appoint regional chairs in Niagara, York, and Peel. Just four years ago, Speaker, in the middle of the municipal election campaign, this government cancelled regional chair elections in these regions, elections in which citizens were electing their chair at large. They didn't trust citizens with free and fair elections. Now, Speaker, they don't even trust democratically elected councillors to choose a chair. Now the Premier is going to handpick who he wants to rule in his stead as he hands them additional powers to do his bidding. Why is the Premier showing such disdain for municipalities and turning local democracy into his own personal sandbox? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. I'd like to know why Jeff Birch doesn't support a great parliamentarian like Jim Bradley. Well, you know. so I'm, I'm going to ask the Minister to refer to his colleagues across the floor by their, by their writing as opposed to their personal name. He can plead his answer. So, Premier Ford made it crystal clear to Ontarians that the, building, the, the Stronger Mayor Building Homes Act was just the start, that we wanted to ensure by the time those two new mayors were uh, sworn in in Ontario's two largest cities, Toronto and Ottawa, he made it crystal clear that that was the start. So the announcement yesterday in Bill 39, which was pretty obvious that New Democrats don't support, just to add to the litany Order. Of, uh, of housing initiatives this government has done, we've done over 90 yeah, since yeah. 2018, and every single time we try to increase housing supply and actually provide an opportunity for a young person to realize the dream of home ownership, Response. New Democrats vote against it. So it's no surprise, Speaker, that this member and their party uh, under the leadership of Merritt Styles is going to not what support. Once again, going to ask 
the minister to refer to members by their writing name. The same courtesy that each of us would expect of each other. Order. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. It's absolutely ludicrous at a time when uh, he is failing education workers and children, pediatric ICUs are over capacity, and we're in an affordable housing crisis. This Premier is laser focused on autocratic changes to municipal government. Right. The Premier isn't just appointing elected positions, he's also expanding strong mayor powers to allow for minority rule while removing environmental protections and gutting conservation authorities. Yeah. Here's what Amos said about the government's recent housing bill. The province has offered no evidence that the radical elements of the bill will improve housing affordability. It is more likely the bill will enhance the profitability of the development industry at the expense of taxpayers and the natural environment. That's AMO, who were not even invited to the Bill 23 hearings that the government just shut down this morning. Speaker, will the Premier admit Question. that he sees municipalities and local democracy as nothing more than a delivery system for his decisions and a way to shop around farmland and green space to his wealthy friends? Mr. Mr. You know, Speaker, I think there's one word that really uh, articulates what New Democrats' position on housing in Ontario is, is and that's banana. Yeah. <laughs> Anywhere near anyone. NBA. That's what New Democrats want. They I want he was high housing tree, prices. Tree. They want young people to have no vision, no dream of home ownership. Again and again and again, New Democrats stand up for bananas. We're going to stand up for Mitchell the dream opposition of home ownership. Yeah. The next question. The member for Brampton East. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. The 2021 consensus, the 2021 consensus listed the city of Brampton as Canada's fastest growing urban centre. Yet, for over a decade under the previous Liberal government, citizens of Brampton felt abandoned. We would continuously raise our health care challenges and increasing unemployment rate. But after a year of and a after a decade of empty liberal promises, last year it's our government that delivered on the long promised second hospital for the people of Brampton. <laughs> the people of my riding are finally starting to see that Brampton is getting its fair share. But questions remain about employment and jobs in the city. Speaker, what is our government doing to ensure that my constituents have good, secure, well-paying jobs, not only for themselves, but for generations to come? Mr. Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Brampton has been a key auto assembly jurisdiction for decades, which is why our government led the Stellantis conversion to EV, shoring up thousands of jobs for further decades. And we also fund the parts makers through our Ontario Automotive, Mod Automotive Modernization Program. In Brampton East, OAMP supported Nahani Steel, TIPCO, RPPL, and SHW pumps, with more than 385,000 in funding. This boosts our supply chain competitiveness, getting them ready to build the cars of the future. Since 2019, Speaker OAMP has leveraged $36 million in investments, private investments from 150 companies, creating over 820 jobs. So, to the member from Brampton East, let your businesses know Parks. that OAMP has opened another intake just this week to assist even more businesses in Brampton to create good-paying jobs. Right. So member for Brampton East. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his answer. It's great to hear that our government is focusing on Brampton's automotive sector. But, Speaker, these are big investments which only apply to a small number of large businesses. While these large businesses provide employment for hundreds of people in my riding, what about the businesses? What about small businesses and startups? Small businesses and startups bring dreams to a reality. I personally know many constituents who rely on their small businesses to provide food for their families. We all know starting a business is hard work work and filled with risk. Speaker, what is our government doing to help entrepreneurs in the city of Brampton to start and grow their business? 
Minister of Economic Development. Well, sadly, the Liberals made starting a business and then running a business almost impossible in the province of Ontario. Mountains of red tape, unaffordable hydro and high taxes, all a recipe for disaster. That's why our government has consistently reduced red tape, lowered taxes and fixed that hydro debacle. Businesses are now saving $7 billion in costs every single year. And now we provide entrepreneurs Response. all the tools they need to grow their business. In, in Brampton, we fund their small business centre with over half a million dollars annually. We provide over 200000 to their summer company and starter company plus to help students and young entrepreneurs start their businesses. And we provided more than $165,000. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker, and my question is to the Premier. Do you remember when the Premier promised up and down he'd never touch the green belt? I do too. Yesterday, this government tabled a bill to repeal the Duffins Rouge Agricultural Preserve Act. This repeal will end the protection of 4,500 acres of prime green belt farmland in Durham. About a third of this land is reportedly owned or controlled by the powerful landowner Silvio de Gasparis, who acquired these farm properties for next to nothing two decades ago. Mr. de Gasparis has donated boatloads to the PC party since the Premier's election, including to the Premier's leadership campaign and his riding association. The only thing standing in the way of Mr. de Gasparis' ability to make untold millions of dollars is the Duffins Rouge Agricultural Preserve Act, and the Premier's government just made that go away. Mr. de Gasparis is about to get much, much richer from land that until yesterday was protected in perpetuity. Does the Premier understand how shady this looks? Here, here. Mr. Municipal Affairs and Housing to reply. Well, Speaker, um, this, uh, this section of Bill 39 is, uh, is the legislative piece of the consultation that we began with Ontarians a couple of weeks ago. We posted uh, on, on, the, uh, on the registry uh, our intent to uh, have 15 properties that will provide uh, at the minimum of 50,000 uh, housing units, and, and in exchange, we are also growing the green belt. We are ensuring that over 2,400 acres of prime agricultural land and uh, significant land like woodlots and, and wetlands are, are part of the Greenbelt. So at the end of the day, uh, the Greenbelt will be expanded. And, and I want to put that 50,000 uh, homes in perspective. These are all properties that are either serviced or close to being serviced. They're exactly uh, beside uh, an existing urban area. Uh, and again, Speaker, in the supplementary, I'll talk about the significance of that minimum 50,000 homes uh, in relationship to our 1.5 million homes. Thank you, Speaker. Um, Mr. DeGasparis has also donated to the Riding Association of the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, the same minister that yesterday tabled the bill to repeal the Duffins Rouge Agricultural Preserve Act. Speaker, the damning articles from the Toronto Star and the Narwhal highlight just how rotten things have gotten. In addition to the Durham agricultural lands, Mr. DeGasparis and his well-connected family are poised to profit immensely from other lands that are also being removed from the Greenbelt. According to the CBC, the DeGasparis family owns three parcels of land in Richmond Hill that the Premier wants to remove from the Greenbelt. And just last year, a company controlled by the DeGasparis family bought Greenbelt land in Vaughan that is also being removed. Remarkably lucky timing. This Premier has frequently accused the previous government of political corruption. So my question is, what does the Premier think we should make of these questionable Greenbelt deals? Mm -hmm. Again, the, uh, the, the land that uh, the member talked about in the first part of the question uh, will provide a significant uh, opportunity for housing. Um, it, it's a property that's been discussed for many, many years. The outgoing mayor of Pickering actually wrote to the government and, and suggested yeah, that this property uh, should be part of, of a future development. Uh, so, so this property has been uh, you know, debated uh, in public uh, since the early 2000s regarding about its opportunity to provide housing. Uh, the specific Cherrywood property will provide up to 25,000 of the 50,000 homes that the government is proposing with this posting on the Greenbelt. And to put it into perspective, the best housing start year since 1987 
was last year with 100,000 homes. The average over the last 30 years of the amount of homes that are being built in Ontario, the average over 30 years is 67,500. So I think the member can understand the significance of why we order. order. The next question, the member for Burlington. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Associate Minister of Women's Social and Economic Opportunity. The COVID-19 pandemic has left many families across Ontario dealing with many challenges. Sadly, the pandemic has increased the frequency and severity of domestic violence for many women in our province. According to the Ontario Association of Interval and Transition Houses, there have been 43 femicides in Ontario within the past year. Living a life free from violence is a fundamental human right, but gender-based violence continues to be a significant barrier to achieving gender equality in Ontario. Speaker, can the minister update this House on our government's work to end gender-based violence? The Associate Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank, I want to thank the parliamentary assistant to the Minister of Colleges and University for your commendable work in providing wraparound support and mental health support for you. Thank you for that. Well, Mr. Speaker, over the break, I had the privilege of attending the 40th Annual Federal, Provincial, Territory Ministers Responsible for the Status of Women, um, which was capped by the announcement of the first national action plan to end gender-based violence. Ontario's, yeah, it's pretty big. Ontario's endorsement of the 10-year National Action Plan to End Gender-Based Violence includes a framework for anyone facing GBB, GBV to have reliable and timely access to protection and services no matter where they live. Mr. Speaker, the Action Plan is anchored by five pillars, supports for victims and survivors and their families, prevention, a responsive justice system, implementing an Indigenous-led approaches and social infrastructure and enabling environments. Environments. And I'm really happy that this agreement marks a milestone investment on Ontario's path to end gender-based violence. Thank you. Thank you. A supplementary question. Speaker, the pandemic has disproportionately impacted women. Women's experiences at home, their health, their work, and their economic well-being have all been negatively impacted. Order. We also know that women already bear a disproportionate Order. role in childcare and caregiving responsibilities. That's why I support our government expanding the Investing in Women's Futures program to more communities across our province. It opens the door to financial freedom and economic security for these women and is foundational in violence prevention. Speaker, can the Associate Minister please share further details on how the Investing in Women's Futures program expansion will proceed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you again to the member from Burlington for the question. And the member is correct. Financial empowerment and security is the found, um, foundational foundation in violence prevention, and that's why I was really proud to be able to announce, alongside with the Minister of Finance and my colleagues from Durham. Um, that our government will expand the Investing in Women's Futures program to up to 10 additional service sites. And Mr. Speaker, the call for proposal has just closed, and I can share with the House that we've received over about 136 applications, and my ministry is currently reviewing those applications, Order. building on the programs that give more background supports. Mr. Speaker, building the programs that give ra women wraparound supports to overcome barriers, build their skills, and gain employment is a key step Response. for women entering and re-entering right. the workforce. So this investment of $6.9 million there. over the next three years the answer? for the 10th. Yes. Thank you very much. Order. Order. The next question. The member or the uh, leader in the, the of Her Majesty's, His Majesty's loyal opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Minister of the Environment. This House hasn't heard much from the Minister for the Environment lately, and no wonder. His government's record on the environment and climate change has sunk to new lows. 
This government is gutting conservation authorities. It's going to allow development on floodplains during a climate crisis. It's ramping up greenhouse gas emissions from our electricity system. It's doubling down on un unnecessary highways that will make congestion and emissions worse. And it's destroying the green belt on behalf of a few powerful landowners and PC donors. What wisdom can the environment minister share at the climate conference in Egypt when he's enabling some of the worst attacks on the environment I've ever seen here in Ontario? Thank you very much, Speaker, and I'd like to respond to the Majesty's opposition. Yes, greetings from the minister from COP27. He's glad to be there representing Ontario and indeed Canada. But I, I'll, we'll take no lessons from the opposition when it comes to our climate change plan. We're very proud of our climate change plan. In fact, we are on target to meet or exceed our commitment for 2020-30, reducing emissions by 30 percent below 2005 levels. And some of the things we have done, for example, electric vehicle production in Ontario, we're going to lead the world. We have massive investments in EV battery production taking place in the Windsor-Essex area. We have we have changed changing furnaces to Arc Electric in both at both Sault Ste. Marie and Hamilton steel mills, which will be the equivalent of taking two million cars off the road. So I say to the, the leader of the opposition, we are well on target to meet or exceed our guarantees for 2030, and we're very proud of our made in Ontario climate change plan. <laughs> Speaker, the Minister for the Environment has been silent during his government's lobbyist-driven attacks on climate, on the Green Belt, on conservation authorities, on farmland, on wetlands, and on and on. After the Minister returns from Egypt and is back on the job, will anyone in Ontario even notice? Well, thanks again to the uh, Leader of His Majesty's loyal opposition. I want to expand on that. Yes. We are making sure that the environment is number one priority at all times in this ministry. However, let's be clear, we were elected in a massive majority by t answering the call that Ontarians gave us to build Ontario. And we're going to, it is, the two are not, I say to the, to the leader, they're not mutually exclusive. We are able to build Ontario and provide what is needed for the increase in population coming over the next couple of decades, and we are able to do that while respecting and protecting the environment. We're able to walk and chew gum at the same time. I understand the people on the other side. Unfortunately, all they want to talk about is blocking our efforts to do what is necessary to make sure that Ontario continues to lead. We will get it both done, both done, and we'll protect the environment at this point. Stop the clock. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Scarborough Guildwood. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. The Premier and his Minister of Education has created ongoing chaos in our education system and confusion for everyone. They have put students, parents, everyone through the ringer. Their heavy handed approach with the notwithstanding clause to force an agreement upon QP was shameful and heavy-handed. This government did the right thing with the repeal of Bill 28, and our faith in democracy has been re restored. But now we need to see a fair deal that is reached at the table. QP asked for $100 million to improve the conditions in the classrooms. This is so that they can have more ECEs in every kindergarten classroom and improve the learning environment in our schools that is so desperately needed. Question. Speaker, will the Premier be willing to work for the majority of Ontarians 
and put an offer to CUPE that increases the services to our students so that we can have peace in our public schools. Minister of Education. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I can confirm to the member opposite that we've increased funding in public education by $3 billion when the Liberals were in power. We've hired nearly 7,000 more workers from when the Liberals were in power. We have another 1,000 educators in our schools from the last time the Liberals were in power. We've done that, Speaker, because our government and our party believes in publicly funded schools. It's why we're increasing investment each and every year, and it's why, Speaker, in this proposal before the union, we're increasing their salaries by $335 million more. Dollars. We're increasing opportunities for benefits, for uh, compensation, uh, for pensions, and of course for sick leave, which we know is generous in this province, especially compared to other provinces. It leads the nation. We are hiring more staff. We are increasing wages. And as the member opposite rightfully recognized, we've withdrawn the bill 28. We did our part. It's now up to the union to do theirs, stay at the table, not to walk away from our kids so that children in this province could stay in school. Supplementary question. Speaker, back to the Premier. You know, in my riding of Scarborough Guildwood, Helen says, my grandson in grade three is behind. He is in grade four. There, is, there are no EAs in the whole school. I am sure there are many who could use extra support. After COVID, many are behind. Many will get lost. Yet we never hear about this in the news. We need to support education workers for all children. Tutors are not the answer. Speaker, this minister just said that they believe in public education, but that is not where their actions confirm. In fact, this government, on the morning of an election, gave Ontarians who have cars $2 billion in checks were issued to them. Recently, in your fall economic statement, $1.2 billion was returned in the gas tax. So, Question. Speaker, if, if this Question. government believes in public education, why is it that you are shamefully putting political tactics and wedging parents against education workers instead of making the classroom investments in public education that are required right now so that our students can catch up and our students can learn. What is required is to get a fair deal at the table. Are you going to get it done? Once again, I'll ask the government side not to interrupt opposition members with applause during their questions. Minister of Education. Thank you, Speaker. The only way for students to get ahead and catch up, as the member opposite noted, is for them to be in class on Monday. And we believe so strongly that children should be in school. I, I, you know, it, it is always perplexing when I don't hear the Liberals or Democrats raise a question to the government about the impact on children, on families, and on the economy when strikes take place. It's as if like you could decouple the impact on children from all of your questions this entire week, and yet we know the impact on children, on special education families, on those who need physical and mental access uh, benefits from our schools. That's why, Speaker, we brought forth a plan, as we committed to, to the people of Ontario, to withdraw Bill 28 to increase funding and spending for wages by $335 million more million week over week. We've also committed to a flat rate, which they required which we have moved on. And, Speaker, we are maintaining their sick leave and their pensions and their health benefits, which few in the private economy could say they have as well. We've brought forth Spons. a program that's designed to respect our workers and keep kids in the classroom. Next question. The member for Carleton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, when people become victims of crime, they can face tremendous harm and trauma, which extends into all facets of their lives. These effects can persist for years and, in some instances, can have lifelong negative implications. Many victims feel isolated and will withdraw from their families, friends, work and community. Our government must stand up for victims of crime by providing them with the needed support and intervention. Mr. Speaker, through you, could the Attorney General please share with us the importance of recognizing individuals and organizations that support people who have faced victimization due to crime? Thank you. The Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank my friend and colleague for the chance to highlight and honour the contributions of individuals and organizations across Ontario who have been recognized through the Attorney General's Victim Services Awards of Distinction. 
We all know in the face of unprecedented challenges, dedicated professionals around Ontario, generous volunteers, outstanding organizations, they've all demonstrated an irrepressible drive to raise awareness of victims' issues, increase access to crisis intervention services, and provide compassionate service and support in times of need. This esteemed recognition highlights the dedication and compassion of professionals, organizations, and volunteers working to support people who have experienced victimization due to crime. The award also recognizes the courageous efforts of individuals who have been personally impacted by crime and are now working to raise the profile of victims' issues in this province, including Response? rural, northern, and indigenous communities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Attorney General for recognizing the individuals and organizations who continue to dedicate themselves to supporting victims of crime. Our government must understand that providing support to victims and their families is crucial in their recovery and contributes to overall community well-being. The people of my riding of Carleton are grateful for the work carried out by the dedicated individuals and organizations who assist victims of crime throughout the National Capital Region and all of Ontario. Mr. Speaker, through you, can the Attorney General please share with the House an example of leadership demonstrated by a previous recipient of the Victim Services Award in support of their community? Thank you. The Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm, I'm thrilled, and we have posted on, on the website the previous winners from last year and the year before, but here's the good news, and I invite all of my colleagues from across, across the aisle and, and on this side to bring to the attention of individuals and organizations who have done great work for victims, who are supporting them and providing services. The award deadline, the nomination deadline, has been extended to December the 9th of this year. And I, further information is available, obviously, on the web page. It's available on the Attorney General's uh, Twitter feed. And I just ask you to highlight for individuals. Often they provide service and they don't feel they're worthy of recognition, but they are. And I would encourage you to encourage them to make sure they get the nomination in. Last year, we gave awards to individuals and organizations in Thunder Bay and Hamilton, Toronto, Ottawa, Oshawa, Sarnia, Thornhill, St. Catharines, Burlington, and Whitby. And this year, Mr. Speaker, I hope and expect that we'll have nominations from as broad a field again. Thank here, you, Mr. Here, Speaker. Here, here. Next question, the member for Scarborough Southwest. Thank you very much, Speaker. Speaker, the 2022 Daily Bread Food Bank report paints an alarming picture for the city, but especially for Scarborough. We have seen a 29% increase in food bank visits in Scarborough. That's over 554,000 visits in 2021. 28 per cent of adults reported missing a day's meal because they did not have enough money for food. I'm not sure what you're laughing. 49 per cent were skipping, skipping meals to make up for the cost of housing or transportation. Speaker, this is one of the richest countries or richest Order. provinces. I, I'm, I'm talking about over 554,000 people who went to the food bank last year. Order. I, Stop the clock. Stop the clock. Government House Leader will come to order. Was there still some time? Was there still some time? Okay. Start the clock. Minister of Finance can reply. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and through you to the member opposite for, uh, for that question. You know, Mr. Speaker, I'm sure the member opposite uh, was here in the House on Monday when we uh, tabled the fall economic statement, which uh, is helping many people uh, who are struggling. Many people are feeling the pinch at the grocery store. Many people are feeling pinch, the pinch at the pumps, feeling the pinch uh, with rent and with mortgage rates going up uh, on housing, Mr. Speaker, and that's why. We moved early to provide relief, increasing minimum wage, lowering the income tax rebate for, uh, for increasing it so that people making a lower income could take more money in their pockets. It's why we gave the license plate stickers back. It's why the Minister of Housing is getting houses built so there can be affordable housing in Ontario. It's why, Mr. Speaker, we doubled the guaranteed annual income supplement for over 200,000 low-income seniors in this province, Mr. Speaker. And it's why. And it's why we increased the earning exemptions 
for people on Ontario disability from $200 to $1,000, many of whom said that is a game changer for people on disability. A supplementary question. Speaker, if the minister thinks that the license plate stickers rebate helps those people in those food banks lineups, he needs to come to Scarborough, and I will take him to those. I will take him to the Bluffs Food Bank. I will take him to the Feed Scarborough Food Bank and show him what's happening there, because those people, those rebates, that does not support the people. And, and yes, that lineup has seniors. It has children. It has people who are on ODSP. You know, ODSP recipients are amongst the top demographic being forced to rely on food bank speaker because we have legislated poverty. And governments, not just this government, I know it's the previous government as well. Government after government has legislated poverty policies from children to seniors to BIPOC communities and communities in my riding of Scarborough Southwest. People are relying on food banks. Poverty Question. costs. And the minister knows that it costs our health care system, it costs our labor force, and it's costing our province. The report also hi highlighted, Speaker, that their guaranteed income security and elimination of systemic poverty is a solution. So my question is simple. Will the government, and I know the fiscal update does not address it. It does not address the crisis that we're facing in our province. It does not address the crisis that we're facing with the wage suppression. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Members place their question. Minister of Finance can respond. Well, uh, thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, so let's uh, let's go back in time a little bit in 2011, and many will remember in 2011 what happened. I was, I was the happy. NDP supported <coughs> the Liberal government for three years. Three years. Now, when they had the opportunity for those three years, if they really believed that they needed to support people on disability, Porter. let me ask you this, Mr. Sat Speaker. Last, let me ask all of Ontario this question. Did they index ODSP no. payments to no. inflation? No, they did not. When they had an opportunity to do that, so, Mr. Speaker, this is a government that is acting. That is why we increased the ODSP payments by 5%. It's why, for the first time since the program was set up over 20 years, that it's getting indexed to inflation, Mr. Speaker, and that's why we increased the earning exception for the hardworking people of Ontario. Order. As we come to order, the next question, the member for Don Valley North. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, the COVID-19 pandemic highlighted gaps in our healthcare system caused by the neglect and indifference from the previous Liberal government. Speaker, we cannot afford to repeat the mistake of the past. We must ensure that people in our province can access the healthcare service they need when they need them. We know that internationally educated nurses in every community are eager to work but have expressed concern over the lens registration process. Speaker, can the Minister of Health update this House on what our government is doing to make it easier for internationally educated nurses to work here in Ontario? Thank you. Thank you. Member for Lawrence. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the hard-working member from Don Valley North for the question and for his advocacy on behalf of internationally educated health care workers. Speaker, this government is breaking down long-standing barriers so that health professionals can work here in Ontario, no matter where they come from. These changes will finally bring more internationally educated health care workers into our health care system faster, helping to care for Ontarians when they need it. So far this year, through our Supervised Practice Experience Partnership Program, over 900 internationally educated nurses have been matched with hospitals, and in total, the College of Nurses has registered 5,848 internationally educated nurses. Working in partnership with the College of Nurses of Ontario and the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario, these changes will Spons? support our record-breaking, historic recruitment plan and make it easier and faster for healthcare professionals to be trained in Ontario. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you uh, to the parliamentary uh, assistance for that response. It is great to hear that changes are being made to help internationally educated nurses work in Ontario much sooner. But as a government, we must do more. Speaker, 
The tired nurses in, our, in my riding of Down Valley North want to return to work and assist those in need once again. But unfortunately, they have faced barriers in applying for the enslavement. Our government must act now to find a solution to bring these nurses and others with medical expertise back into practice. Speaker, can the minister provide more details on what else our government is Question. doing to expand our health care workforce? Thank you. Member Craigington Lawrence. Thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you again to the member for that question. The important changes that will come into effect immediately include allowing internationally educated nurses to register in a temporary class and begin working sooner while they work toward full registration, making it easier for non-practicing or retired nurses to return to the field by introducing flexibility to the requirement that they need to have practiced nursing within a certain period of time before applying for reinstatement, and creating a new temporary independent practice registration class for physicians from other provinces and territories, making it easier for them to work up to 90 days in Ontario. Additionally, even more changes will come into effect on January first, including requiring health regulatory colleges to comply with time limits to make registration decisions, prohibiting health uh, regulatory colleges from requiring Canadian work Response. experience for the purpose of registration, and accepting language tests provided under the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act to reduce duplicate language proficiency testing for immigrants who want to practice here. Together, these changes are going to help make sure we have the health care workers we need in Ontario. Next question, the member from Thank you. Question for the Minister of Health. Their health providers to alleviate the burden they face. The Hearst Hospital had made a proposal in March 2021 for an extra anesthesiologist. Speaker, my office spent two follow up letters for a response. I have given two letters in person to the Minister. Now the Hearst Hospital is facing another crisis. They need a minimum of 10 doctors. Presently, they have six, and two are retiring soon. My question, Minister, if we can't get an answer for an extra anesthesiologist, will the Minister agree today, in the next two weeks, to meet with the Hearst Hospital to address these two crises so that we can find a solution so desperately needed for the Hearst area? Member for Eglinton Lawrence. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. I haven't seen the letters you referred to, um, and I can't speak to the minister's schedule, but our government does understand the unique health care challenges in the North, and we're committed to ensuring that everyone in Ontario has access to the health care that they need. While physician supply across Ontario is projected to consistently exceed population growth, leading to an average annual net increase of approximately 581 physicians each year until 2029. We know that there are still some northern communities that have trouble recruit, recruiting and retaining doctors, which is why our government is investing in initiatives to help improve access to physician services across the north. And this includes, for example, $32 million this year for resident salaries and benefits, medical education and training, allied health professionals and remote First Nations Response. family residency programs at the Northern Ontario Medical School. We'll continue working to make sure everyone on Ontario has the health care that they need. Thank you. My question is to the Premier. The government can't ignore our health care crisis any longer. In Niagara, only 17 per cent of patients are receiving MRIs within the provincial target times. The average wait time in Niagara is 164 days. A constituent in my community has informed my office their 90-year-old mother, Joyce, who requires an MRI, if severe, has severe back issues, will have to wait until August 2023. The Niagara community rallied to raise funds for another MRI machine. The Niagara Health received funding to run the Niagara MRI machines. So why is this happening? We know that Niagara has not been spared from the provincial health care staffing crisis. When will the Premier work with Niagara Health, address our health care staffing issues in this province, reduce our outrageous MRI wait times, repeal Bill 124, Question. and at least 
ensure Joyce can get an MRI in a reasonable time frame and not have to wait till August. Thank you. Member Frank, good morning. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, the member opposite, for the question. Our government has got a record uh, investment in recruitment, retaining, uh, and training new health care providers, and we're making sure we have health care providers all across the system. The College of Nurses of Ontario has reported that in the first eight months of this year, they registered 12,800 wow. nurses. That is a record. Amazing. Uh, so our changes and our investments are having an effect. And I understand that nobody likes Order. to wait for diagnostic imaging, and diagnostic imaging has uh, caught up our surgical backlog. Uh, we've, we've had uh, uh, the diagnostic imaging actually exceeding uh, targets uh, that existed before, although uh, there may be one reason why this individual is waiting. I understand that Niagara has just got a new MRI machine, so I hope she gets her MRI very shortly. Opposition come to order. The next question, the member for Glengarry Prescott Russell. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Francophone Affairs. COVID-19 has had an important effect on the Francophone of Northern Ontario, which is half of the north of Canada. Our government has done several investments to protect the economy. When there was an announcement regarding these funds, in my writing, we could see the, the impact. Speaker, can the minister tell us a bit more about the second step of these funds to promote the commerce between provinces. Member for Mississauga Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you to my colleague for his question, which is a very important question. I'm glad to work with him to promote Ontarian Francophony in his writing and in the whole province. I would also like to congratulate the person receiving this prize. This company attests the quality of the products of Franco-Ontarian communities. This prize, the Ontario Quebec Francophonie Prize, is a way of recompensate our companies to promote interprovincial commerce and innovation, which are at the very center of these efforts, the efforts made by our government. This is for this is meant for companies who have Francophonie at the heart of their strategies. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you for the Minister and the Parliamentary Assistant for the reply. I'm glad to hear that there are initiatives to promote Francophony. In my writing, we have a very dynamic Francophone community that contributes to our local economy. We want to promote these companies so that they can be more prosperous. Speaker, can the minister and her assistant explain a bit more about the value of francophonie as an economic advantage? <laughs> thank you, Speaker, and thank you again for this question. Yes, of course, it's the goal of our ministry to reignite francophonie. The future of francophone language, the beautiful language of Molière, is promoted by this prize, by means of which we attest the importance of this language and francophone and companies in our province. This remind us of the excellence of francophone projects, and this contributes to strengthen the relationship between our provinces. Entrepreneurs and companies that are francophone contribute to the promotion of francophony. 
And I want to remind everybody that our government takes francophonie as a priority, essential for economy. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. I know that he's arrived, so that your timing is perfect. Because... Just a second. Yeah, that, that actually... Just, uh, stop the clock. Yeah, that statement did, in fact, cross the line in terms of making reference to the absence of a member. Um, and again, I don't know why I have to keep explaining this. It's in all of our interests not to do that. Let's not do it again. Order. The next, start the clock. Member of Toronto Centre has the floor. Thank you, Speaker. And my question is still for the Premier. Because of the changes that, to billing that are coming under the Physician Services Act, this will effect will come into December the, the 1st, 2022. Physicians like those who are actually practicing at virtual only care clinics, such as Connect Clinic, will have to stop delivering gender affirming care. Gender affirming care, Speaker, as many will know, is life saving care. Care that cl Connect Clinic's 1,500 patients, as well as 2,000 wait listed patients, will then lose access by the end of this month. Many of those patients live in rural communities. They are without access to family doctor. Many of them are actually reliant on virtual care. It's the only access to care that they have. Will the government commit to alternative funding plan in order to meet the needs of trans and gender diverse people in Ontario? Thank you very much for the question, um, and thank you, Speaker. On March 28, a three-year, 2022, a three-year physician services agreement was ratified by the Ontario Medical Association and its members, and it's a true milestone, as it is the first time that a deal has been reached in over a decade without an arbitrator. Under the new virtual care framework, the ministry and the OMA are implementing a new pricing structure for virtual care, something which didn't really exist before the pandemic, that ensures that patients are receiving services through the avenue that best reflects a patient-physician relationship, video versus telephone. We want to be clear. All medically necessary virtual care services, including initial patient, patient visits by telephone, will be continued to be insured under OHIP. Patients will continue to have access to clinically appropriate virtual care, Spons? where virtual care is the appropriate service, like in rural and remote mental health services. We're going to make sure that Ontarians get the care that they need, and we're making virtual care permanent for the first time ever. Thank you, Speaker. Unfortunately, that did not answer the question. Uh, Speaker, my second question is to the Premier. The patients waiting for gender-affirming care want a concrete answer. They're hoping to have it today. Yesterday, I tabled my private member's bill, Gender Affirming Health Care Advisory Committee Act. This House, on numerous occasions and previous governments, have actually created working groups, advisory committees, roundtables to inform the government on their work. It actually helps them build better programs and services and legislation for the people of Ontario. Will this government support that bill? Will this government stand for the trans and gender diverse community? November the 20th is Trans Day of Remembrance. It's coming up. Many of the members will be attending those events. Will you be able to pass this bill today? Thank you. Member for Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for the question. We want to, this government wants to make sure that every Ontarian has the health care that they need and deserve, and Ontario funds uh, team-based care, such as community health centres and family health teams, to improve access to primary care for vulnerable populations and trans populations. Many uh, primary care teams run primary care programs as part of their LGBTQ plus services or specific clinics for trans populations, providing interdisciplinary primary care services including mental health services for their clients. In addition to the many groups that provide services to the trans community, there are two specific family health teams that have dedicated trans programs, the Kuchiching Family Health Team, uh, 
for Trans Health Services and the Queen Square Family Health Team in Brampton for Trans Health Gender Health Community. And there is also the Sherburne uh, Health uh, Community Health Centre, which provides guidance and resources that what? could be used by all primary care providers when caring for transgender individuals. Ontario also funds over 500 community-based mental health and addictions providers across the province. These are services targeted to LGBTQ+, and available through many of the agencies free of charge. Thank you. That concludes our question period for this morning. Government House Leader has a point of order.